because I've had lots of painful and embarrassing experiences in the past, which made me realize I need to skill up. And the number one thing I found is that when I started to section teeth, that's when extractions became much more predictable for me. That's when I managed to really gain a lot of confidence in extractions, the ability to section. So guys, one evening in Singapore, as you guys know, I used to work in Singapore, and it's a fascinating country and a brilliant dental system. And the interesting thing about it is that sometimes I'd start my shift at 9 a.m. and finish my shift at 9 p.m. Now, I know that sounds really crazy, like, oh my God, you're overworking, you're gonna burn out kind of thing, but it really didn't feel like that. The busy periods were like the morning session and the evening session, and the afternoon session was almost like a siesta. You know, you can go to sleep, you can have some dim sum, you can go out for an extended lunch, I can go out with my wife. It was it was a cool experience, you know, and it wasn't very stressful at all. I, I really enjoyed working in Singapore. Now, the fascinating thing is that one day I finished my shift at 9 p.m. Uh, and I was getting on the MRT, their train system back home, and I was just walking to my apartment. And I had these um, famous noodles with me and they were hot and ready to eat and I was so excited to go home and absolutely devour these noodles, right? But here's the thing, right? You guys might know that my wife is also a dentist. And and uh, as I'm walking up to my flat, I'm getting, I get a call from my wife uh, and she says, uh, Jazz, I need your help. I'm like, but what do you mean? What do you need my help with? What, what's wrong? What happened? It's, it's like, it's past nine o'clock. Why are you even still at the surgery, right? She goes, well, uh, I kind of started this extraction at 8.30 uh, and this tooth is not moving. Like, I cannot remove this tooth. Can you please rescue me? Now, um, in my past uh, as a DF1, as a young dentist, I've been rescued a few times, okay? It's, it, it's always embarrassing in a way to ask for help, but it's always like, it's something that you just, you know, when you're, when you're struggling with an extraction, it's so great to have someone next door who can come in and help you. And I've been rescued so many times. Uh, and of course, it's my wife, I was never gonna say no. I had to leave my hot noodles and absolutely literally run to the clinic. And the clinic was about a five minute runaway. So literally I put my massive suitcase down, had all my like um, camera, my loops, everything inside, I didn't need any of it. Uh, and I literally ran from my flat in Singapore, it was like a condo apartment, to the clinic which was five minutes away so I was running 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 by the time I got there I had to just wait in the air conditioning to let all the sweat sort of dry off uh, and, and I come in and thing is it was it was an awkward scenario because I kind of wanted to maintain that professional feel and I, I, I couldn't just come in and be like, hey, I'm the, the hero husband who's gonna who's gonna save you. Firstly, I didn't even know if, if I could rescue the scenario or not, right? I mean, at the time, I'm, I'm pretty confident in extractions now. At the time, I was really gaining my confidence. I wasn't like super confident. And I, I guess it was probably one of the first few times that I was called for, for help. So I felt like, wow, I, I need to step up it and help. I didn't really know what the situation was. Anyway, I come in uh, and I maintain my professionalism. I, I pretended to the patient that this wasn't my wife, this was just a dentist colleague who needed my help. I'm like, oh yes, hello, Dr. Kaur, um, how can I help you? She was like, oh yeah, the, this is um, so-and-so and, -so, and uh, we're extracting the upper left second molar and uh, the, the crown is broken off, can you help us? So I do a quick medical history check, I chat to the patient, it's like, okay, don't worry, sir, uh, I will uh, remove this tooth for you, okay? Uh, and so here is the thing, right? When I've been stuck in the past, when it comes to an extraction, it was because I did not know how to, and I did not know when to section roots and elevate the roots, basically, okay? So sectioning is a huge skill, and at that time, I just recently started to become more confident in it. So all I did was I um, I got my handpiece uh, and I sectioned this upper left second molar into its three different roots, media buckle, distal buckle, and palatal. And that's all I did. I sectioned it and I put my elevator in and I said to the patient, you will hear a crack. Crack. Okay, so it cracks uh, and literally within about 10 minutes, I had everything out and everything came out beautifully. Like, yes, it was a it was a tough extraction if you don't know how to section and if you don't know how to section elevate. Now, the funny thing is all that time I was maintaining um, a sort of a professional feel and inside I was really, really chuffed. I was really pleased that I managed to rescue my wife and get this uh, tooth out and I felt like the real hero. And uh, I, I, at the end, you know, when you're the hero, when you take out the extraction, the, what, you, what do you do? Well, you take all the credit and you walk away and you, and you let the dentist who's asked for help, you let them do the suture right because you're, you're like the king right? you've done your bit you can walk away right but the funny thing is right in the last moment I said hey babe can you can you stitch up for me I was like hey babe can you stitch up for me and I was like really embarrassed because this patient wasn't supposed to know that this is my wife but anyway it, that was kind of awkward so I said I just walked away and uh, I just uh, like I don't know how I started drinking something in the, in the staff room while my wife was finishing off this uh, scenario and the, the, you know, the thing is it wasn't a difficult scenario if you knew how to section and
and this is why I've created this episode. I've got Chris Waith, who's an oral surgeon based in the northwest of England. And what I've always admired about Chris is his reputation on social media. Like whenever someone talks about gaining some sort of oral surgery mentorship or oral surgery advice, he's the first person to help. So I want to bring him on to help you regain your confidence in extractions. And the number one way, which is a protrusive dental pearl, is to be able to section teeth. If you can learn how to section roots and know when to do it and how to do it, which this episode will cover, you will dramatically increase your success rate when it comes to extractions. You can really be quicker at extractions, more efficient, um, less invasive, less traumatic by learning how to section. And I think it was that skill. And I talk about my experiences in this episode. Uh, we're also joined, by the way, with uh, by Zach Cara. So it's going to be a really fun episode. You know it because Zach's in it as well. So I hope it's going to give you a lot of value and I'll catch you in the outro. Chris Waith, uh, long awaited. Welcome to Producing on Podcast, my friend. How are you today? I'm really well, thanks, mate. How are you? Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Really buzzing for this episode. And today we are also joined by Zach Cara, who is an absolute veteran to the podcast. Uh, I, I, Oi, oi, man. <laughs> Good to get you back again, even though your 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 audio sounds uh, so noisy. Uh, I think the listeners will forgive you. Thank you. I'm so sorry in advance. I, I, I'm clearly, obviously going to have to upgrade and go pro level. I'm clearly a small timer compared to you, just so. <laughs> Not at all, not at all. The most important thing is that Chris sounds great. Uh, and this is really important because extractions, and I'm, and I'm titling, I think I'm going to title this episode Regaining Confidence in Extractions. Uh, and the reason that title came to me is because, uh, and we were just talking about this before I hit the record button, uh, Chris, you were saying that you made a lot of your big mistakes in the first few years. The time I've been most uh, embarrassed uh, is when I have started an extraction and not been able to finish it. And then either the patient has had to go a couple of miles down the road to my principal who's working on the surgery, or someone had to um, have a massive delay in their day to rescue me. Or, unfortunately, on one occasion, sending someone home just with the roots there, you know, after a bloody mess. Uh, and that made me realize I need to do something. I really need to skill up in extractions. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that from today, we're going to help a lot of people who may be about to enter that scenario or those who are on the other side. And now, uh, like some of my colleagues, they don't want to do extractions anymore. They completely refer them on. So I'm hoping that's going to add a lot of value for everyone. Zach, has that happened to you, my friend? Big time. Do you know the thing that I um, found I needed to really upskill in is the ability to sort of tell the story Almost not that you're commentating too much because, you know, the too much you say, you, you land in a, a hole verbally, if that makes sense, during the procedure. But the thing that I found that you need to do as things are maybe not quite going on course is you kind of need to wriggle your way through this. And the things that you do and you say and how you say it steer the conversation into, you know, basically what you're trying to do on a daily basis is, is um, under promise and over deliver, isn't it? So the more that you guide that into and look like a magician at the end of a procedure, you get to the end and you go, yep, that's, you know that feeling. Everyone's got, had that feeling a few times, haven't they? And we all love it of somebody going, is that it? Or is it out? That thing. We love that, don't it? That's like, oh, yeah, I just, uh, just check my cape. Is this nice and straight there? That's superhero style. Um, that kind of stuff. But how do you get there is really the key thing. So how do you get there? I think a massive bit of oral surgery is what you say and when you say it like once a week i'll have a patient where and i mean i, t I take what patients tell me with a massive pinch of salt but when they come in and they'll, they'll say things like so you're going to peel my gum back or you're going to break my jaw and and you kind of look at them and just think ah i'm already losing i was like if you just said the right thing to begin with so you avoid all that negative language and it's like you know this is just a little bit of pulling and pushing this is a noise just like the drill when you have a fill-in. It's only a bit of rattling and water. And so I, I'm the one in control and I'm the calm head because my patient won't be calm and my, my nurse might not be, but I can control them as long as I'm kind of saying and doing the right thing. So I, I know it comes with like practice and over time, but I think the way you behave in surgery will make your day better or worse. And sometimes I think you almost need to kind of take a step back that if, if you like Jazz said, if you get into that point where you're losing your confidence a little bit, um, you've kind of got to look at how you work and break your work down into easier, manageable chunks and then just concentrate on that little chunk. And then once you've got it sorted in your head, everything else will click into place then. Um, so I, I always say to people, it's like, you know, have, have your 
plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. Don't just go in with plan A and carry on with it. Because uh, that's that patient where you look at the clock and you've just spent 50 minutes trying to elevate a tooth. And after 10 minutes, you could have looked and said, ah, oh, this isn't happening, actually. So it's time to pick my drill up. And in our head, I think we've got that like barrier where we think, oh, no, I'm not going to pick my drill up because it's traumatic for the patient. But it's the other way around. It's like, no, pick your drill up. So they're not on 40 minutes of elevating that's doing no good. That's going to be the, the meat of the episode, I think, talking about the importance of a section and elevating. Uh, actually, we're, we're, going to, we're going to say that for the real meat and potatoes of it. But before, uh, Chris, you became the master of extractions, did you have any of those uh, embarrassing moments like I've had where you failed an extraction? It's just a, a gut-wrenching, you know, you feel like a massive failure. Uh, did that happen to you as well in your journey? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, my two or three biggest cock-ups... And like we were saying before offline, you know, the first few years when I'm looking at me working, I kind of look back and think, I, d I don't know whether I was overconfident or underprepared or a little bit of both, but y I've had I've had a nerve injury taking a cyst out. I've had a nerve injury taking a wisdom tooth out. Um, I've burnt a lip. Um, doing some difficult extractions on a patient. And I look, I look back now and think, you know, compared to me five years ago, I feel loads happier than I was then. And from that point to five years earlier, I felt loads happier. And it, it, it's all right kind of building up your experience and getting a little bit more kind of competent and confident. But I, th I think the hard bit, it's, it's those first few years. It's kind of starting off on a strong foot and get everything in place. And, and actually, you know, accept the fact that you can't do everything because there'll still be a patient where as long as your assessment's right, draw a line and say no. And that's all right. It's, it's not failing. It's doing the right thing for the patient. And that's what I didn't do when I was younger. There were a few patients where I should have said. There's a huge aspect to this, Chris. I don't know if you've got any sneaky shortcuts and things to help people with. But one huge part of that, though, is, is that you don't know what you don't know, do you? So you can easily walk yeah. into traps. And I've, you know, I remember it very clearly as a VT asking for a, a assistance from an associate dentist who was two years more qualified than I was. And this was in a in a an outreach practice in Sheffield as well. So we, we were used to this kind of training environment. And I remember very clearly working through lunchtime, trying to pull on this swinging on this upper six like Johnny McEnroe, you know, like double handed technique. Because it's going to come out sometime. I'm just going to keep going kind of thing. <laughs> I wasn't actually too handy just to clarify. But you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and the associate friend of mine, colleague of mine, come in and tried to use a different technique and used his left hand, so his upper left molar, stood behind the patient, pulled with, like, with, their, with his left hand and gave, just gave it an enormous yank to the buckle, right? And it all went horribly wrong and basically landed me with um, an OAC and a buckle plate fracture and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, holy moly, what on earth mess am I in now kind of thing? But I didn't know... I thought he had some sort of special skills or something and something I hadn't seen before. And to be really straight, I hadn't actually assessed the uh, morphology of his tooth correctly myself in the first place. So I shouldn't even have been there. You know, I, I was a VT, uh, DF, I'm sorry, new language, not old language, but in old money, that was VT. And um, yeah. But before then, we, that leads nicely to the, 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 the first big question, which is what are the features that you could assess, Chris, in helping people determine not, not to fall into that trap in the first place of, you know, just like Zach said, not assessing morphologically what might uh, constitute a difficult extraction. But before we come to that, Zach, I want to add to that, that, you know what? That's exactly what you want in a way. When you struggle with an extraction, you kind of don't want the new guy to come and just take it out in two seconds because that makes you look like really rubbish. You kind of, the, 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 the times I remember is I, I've struggled, then my principal comes and my principal struggles for an hour and then you're like, oh good, that justifies it. It wasn't just me. No, no it's because you fractured it so subgingively. You broke it down so badly <laughs> that you made his life a misery, mate. That's why. <laughs> if you had asked him to come in after 10 minutes, it'd have been out like that. <laughs> That's actually, unfortunately, closer to the truth. But, but Chris, um, what, what are the, the, the features, clinical and radiographic, uh, and not wisdom teeth? Let's talk about molars, right? Let's talk about molars, which are yeah. probably the ones that we uh, step up on the most. That clinical and radiographic that make you think that, hang on a minute, don't just go straight for the forceps or, or, or take a step back and reassess the, or assess, reassess all the difficulty of it. From a patient point of view, I probably just need to know, are they on board? So can they comply with what I need to do to them? And like, like, I mean, our service, we've got a massive sway towards anxious patients. So I try to dig into what they're anxious about, because if they're anxious about the, the drill, we might have a problem because I section a lot of teeth. But if they're anxious about somebody swinging on a molar, actually, I think if I section that, I've got rid of that part of it because I've made it easier. So it's just about explaining it to them. Uh, physically, really, I just want to know about access. 
So as long as I can get into the area that I need to get, so we, we'll see loads of upper wisdom teeth and we'll say, oh, you know, the access is difficult. And I'll sit the patient back and I'll just say, you know, if I'm doing upper right, you just slide your jaw over to the right hand side and then let me swing on your cheek. And if I can get the tip of my mirror to the tooth, I know that I can elevate it. And it's like a 30 second assessment. And then I know that I'm good to good to go. So if the patient's on board and my access is okay, then I'm happy enough to start. And then I, th I think if you're looking at the tooth and if you're looking at your radiograph, just have a systematic way of kind of approaching it. So I, I kind of go top down. So I look at the crown of the tooth that I'm taking out and the two teeth either side. And I'll want to know how big the filling is. Is there a crown? Is it pinned? Is it post crowned? Is it root filled? I'll go down to the roots and just think, right, are they tapered? Are they convergent? Are they divergent? How many roots are there? And kind of getting increasingly difficult are the kind of straight curved dilacerated bulbous then i'll go to the ligament and like it's really rare that i'll see a tooth that is properly ankylosed but i'll see loads of teeth where the ligament space is very small and so picking that up on the x-ray i'll think that's more likely to be a surgical because i've got less wiggle room when i'm luxating and elevating against it then i'll go to the surrounding bone and just think kind of you know less dense dense very dense and then i'll go to anatomy so i'll go further and say right are there any nerves close by is the sinus close by is the interradicular space the space between the the tooth I'm taking out and the teeth either side is that small or large as well how much wiggle room have I got and if I go through all of that I think then I've got my answer to say right what's the way to take the tooth out then um and then it's my plan a plan b plan c plan d am I just let's eating and elevating using my forceps plan b might be right pick up my drill section the tooth if that's not working, take out some interradicular bone. If that's not working, lift a flap, remove some bone. And like oral surgery is, I think it's scary because it's very black and white. It's like you've hurt them, you haven't. The tooth is out or it's not. But actually, it's really simple because we've only got a few ways to take the tooth out. And all you've got to do beforehand is plan your way. And when it's not working, stop and then change to your next way. Um, so you've just got to tick those boxes, I think. I mean, two things you said, said so far in this episode, uh, which uh, I really respect, because something we don't talk about enough in the context of oral surgery and extractions is the communication side, which Zach, Zachary nicely brought in about communicating to an oral surgery patient is, is, is you know, it's a whole different thing that we need to focus on as well to gain the best results. So that's something that's uh, seldom discussed. Uh, and B, something that also, um, you might know this oral surgeon, George Palanellis. I'm rubbish with names. <laughs> George, fantastic guy, works at a guy's hospital uh, and, and private practice. Uh, he taught me the importance when I was at guys doing a DCT in oral surgery. He taught, taught me the importance of having a plan. Like so often we'd say, so, okay, we've got to take a tooth out. Right, let's just let's just start with four steps and see where we go. Whereas actually to have like, just like you echoed as well, Chris, like having a plan A, a plan B, a plan C. So my, my next question, oh, by the way, uh, when you talked about all those features that you assess, one thing that you didn't mention, but I think, and I might be wrong here, I think it has a big bearing on the difficulty of extraction as well, is if the, someone has got exostoses or thick um, cortical uh, plate of bone, buckley, um, that's, that's caught me out before when you try and take it out and then suddenly the whole bony plate fractures or the, the crown fractures because the bone is quite solid. Is that something that you um, a, a notice as well? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a very common one. Dent, dense bone on its own is, uh, excess doses maybe isn't, but th there'll be certain areas regardless. So in guys, I, I always think it's lower eight seven six. Um, external oblique ridge is there. You've got your thickest part of your mandible. You've got your masseter insertion in the bruxis as well. They'll have dense bone. They, those teeth, I'll look at that to begin with and think I've got a really low level here where I'm going to pick my drill up. Because if I try and take that buckley, I'm, I'm trying to move the tooth against the thickest, strongest bit of bone. And as I take it buckley, if I, if I lose my angle with my forceps, then the crown is off and I've just made that loads more difficult. So before I even start, pick my drill up section the tooth and now i'm drilling those bits of tooth mesially and distally and the only thing i'm pushing against is the interradicular bone now so i've moved the physics in my favor and re really that's all extraction is it my, my old matt's fats consultant had a blinder because he just kind of looked at me and just said well listen you can only do one of two things you either make the socket wider or you make the tooth smaller 
and I kind of thought, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, actually, that's so, that's so simple, it's brilliant. I was like, yeah, yeah. If that, you're trying to move right. a sofa out a window, just, you know, take the door off, <laughs> make your life, make your life yeah. even bigger. <laughs> just so you can get it out, just, you know, make yeah. life simple. By the way, can I just add something? You should have seen the look on Jazz's face there, I don't know if you saw, but the look on his face as soon as you mentioned Bruxism and Massetus, he was like, whoa, I'm in heaven right now. He's managed to introduce <laughs> all surgery and for the protrusive dental podcast, just <laughs> fusion, I love it. No, no, I was going to say, um, uh, I'll try not to mention soft bite guards and stuff. Uh, we'll keep that one out in an oral surgery-based episode. So we'll not, we'll not embarrass you, Chris. Um, Let's not go there. <laughs> uh, there's one other thing I wanted to say, by the way. I've got something to say. Chris, you said getting a patient on board or checking if they're on board. Have you got any sneaky shortcuts or anything that you, you kind of have picked up over the years that's become part of your spiel to kind of ask the right question at the right time as soon as they enter the treatment room? Because I presume you have a referral practice, right? So yeah. how do you make sure that person's on board? The last like 18 months has been mo- more difficult because I'm a big like see the whole face person. So I want to see the white of their eyes. And actually, I like shaking the hand because I can feel the sweat or the warmth or the shakiness. So before I've even said anything, I'm like, right, okay, so I've got a little bit of a battle here. I'll always get the patient in clear specs or kind of tinted rather than sunglasses because I want to see their eyes all the way through. I don't wear uh, loops. I just wear my glasses because I want to be able to see the tooth and the face. If I'm if I'm talking to the patient, I, th- I think the there are two different ways that you play it. One is don't introduce any negative language. So don't talk about sharp, pain, hurt. You've got to dress it up as uh, if you're giving your local anesthetic, I'm making you more comfortable rather than saying, you know, I'm trying to make sure it doesn't hurt. Because as soon as you say hurt, you've planted a seed that's there. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't hurt because that's not how pain works in their head. If they feel like it is, then it is. So try not to plant the seed, which is going to kind of work against you. But I think the other thing for patients is is just talk about it. If if there was one thing that I think patients want sometimes is just our time and to be heard and listened to. Um, And so if somebody comes in and it's really obvious they're anxious, uh, I'm not afraid to say to them, you know, what, what is it you're anxious about? And if they tell me it's the injections, then I'll think, right, let's get the topical out. Let, let's, you know, put our TLC gloves on and take a little bit more time with the local anesthetic bit. Because once I know they're numb, the rest of it's going to be all right. If they don't like a drill, I mean, I can try and section a tooth with my hand instruments, but I maybe need to talk it up to say I'm making this extraction as easy as I can do and as comfortable as I can do to offset to them using the drill for a couple of minutes and i mean i think dentistry is full of that whichever thing that you're doing knowing what your patient does and doesn't like um and i mean it's not that you can avoid it but it's how you dress it up and how you get the patient through it so so i say chris one thing i i I say to my patients um is that there might be some cutting there might be some drilling is there a better way for me to say that? Because I, I want them to not live in this fancy world where, you know, I'm, I do section a lot of teeth and that's going to be the main part of the episode I want to talk about. And I'm really excited to get to that. But, but I do want my patients to know to expect that, you know, there'll be a bit of cutting, there'll be a drilling. Don't worry. You will not feel a thing. I'll make sure you're comfortable. But I, I do set it up for them that, hey, there'll be some cutting and drilling. Is there a better way for me to say that? I don't think I, I'd ever say cutting only because it's veering into that negative kind of connotation with it in my head if if i'm the patient once they're anesthetized whatever i'm doing to them is probably only going to be one of a few um senses for them that it'll be the noise the water of the drill if i'm using it the vibration of the drill and everything else is kind of pulling and pushing so if i'm raising a flap uh really what i'm going to prepare them for is some pulling and pushing but i'm not I'm not going to say I'm just going to cut this flap and pull it away from your bone because as soon as I do that, I'm I'm kind of tearing down the other side. And I might say to them, you know, I'll pop some stitches at the end, but I'll try and dress that up as, oh, we're almost finished. The tooth is out, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to put these stitches in. They'll help you heal. 
you don't need to worry about them. They just dissolve. It, you know, it's all about being fluffy and warm because really oral surgery is not a fluffy and warm place. So I think you've got to, you've got to take every win that you can get. And then you look like a bit of a legend because, oh, he put extra stitches in and everything. Oh, what a lovely guy he was. Yeah, he really yeah. was looking after me. He didn't have to put two in, but, you know, he, he put two extra. He put one extra in just because. And you're thinking, well, no, it was a three, three-sided three flap, so, you know, two interrupted sutures. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that, those, those little things, I mean, having that extra little bit for your patient for them to think that you actually care about them, stuff like that. And then I like to do my own post-op instructions rather than getting the girls to do it because I want it to be a little bit more personal. Um, and I'll have a really long chat with them about how to control the pain and what dry socket is and things. And it's it's only because I don't want them to have a problem that they ring reception. I want them to know what it is and maybe not worry about it. And then if I've done something really difficult, we'll call them the next day and just make sure everything's all right. And then if we need to, call them a week later. And I think if you do that, the patients think you're great because you actually care about what you're doing. And it's it's not just, I've got the tooth out, it's the patient on the end of the tooth then that you've brought kind of back into the fold and, you know, you're caring about them as much as you can do. Yeah, absolutely. There's one key thing there. There's one key thing there that I have evolved into my spiel over the years, which has now become pretty much the beginning part of any treatment or procedure, which is kind of something along the lines of, um, you know, you do your continuous conversation, rapport building stuff, you know, continue the chat. I appreciate, Chris, if you're in a referral practice, that's difficult because it might be the first time you've met this person face to face. But if we kind of lead into the dental stuff by saying something like, um, just to make sure we're on the same page, by the way, what are you expecting to happen today? If I lead in like that, it's a very open ended question and it helps them say things like, oh, you're going to rip my tooth out, aren't you? And if they say it like that, then it gives you an opportunity to kind of go, okay, my next question is actually going to be how you're feeling about it. But I sense that you might not be, I might know you're, you know, I might not be your biggest fan today kind of thing. Or you can kind of dress up with a bit of humor. Like, like you say, you can help mold and steer the conversation into a, like, let's face it, you don't really want to be here. And sometimes I go, I don't really want to be here either. But um, then you can kind of go, you know, you can dress it with the professionalism as well. So I completely agree with you. You need to kind of let them steer the conversation. And I also like to introduce very early on in the conversation at the beginning of the um, appointment, um, signposting next steps. You're absolutely right. I tend to say, what are you up to for the rest of the day, by the way? Because that's going to help yep. me with my post-op instructions. Or you did say, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to go home, have lunch, blah, 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 blah. But you can then build that in mm-hmm. so that it feels like it's a tied-in procedure, which is truly customized and personalized for that person. You're not just another person on a conveyor belt. Yeah, it just shows you listen. Yeah, I think if they know that you listen, uh, they're, they're much more on board with what you're going to do. And actually, you know, looking worst case, you get fewer complaints. Because they know that you're tailoring everything to them. You've been more personable about it. Uh, it's not just conveyor belt, next patient. Zach, do you fancy yourself at extractions? Do you shy away or are you, are you like, you know what, I got this? I was really fortunate. I put together a, an elective project in Madagascar when I was a fourth year student. And I went basically in and uh, managed to resource and, and and get a whole load of oral surgery equipment and um, pulled out about 500 teeth in my two-week elective. So I actually got a lot of experience very early doors. And then I've done a couple, well, quite a few Bridge to Age projects. So shout out to the Bridge to Age crew if you're listening. Um, and I was a site clinical lead with them for a couple of years. So I've done quite a lot of extractions in quite difficult scenarios with no minimal light and no you know, surgical gear. But you're right, Chris, there is a downside of that, which is that I've now gone to the other end of the you know working world, which is that I'm in you know, most, mostly aesthetically focused private practice. And I don't really take teeth out. I don't need to. There's not, it doesn't hit my radar very often in my week. So um, now I tend to, if I do hit uh, an oral surgery procedure, I tend to go too far down the road of making one plan and going with it. And so if you were to ask me like, out of 10 how confident I am compared to how I used to be, probably a four out of 10. Uh, that's a very uh, good and honest reflection. And I thought that the reason I wanted to ask you before you move on to Chris's expertise is <clears throat> I want to gauge what GDPs are thinking. So you're an example of someone who actually got lots of experience up front, um, got really confident with extractions, but it's just a lot of people are just doing lots of orthodontics at the moment, lots of Invisalign, they're doing the sexy dentistry and, you know, the extractions aren't as sexy, let's face it. I enjoy it and I only enjoy extractions. You have to listen, I only enjoy extractions because I'm happy to say that I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm not going to say I'm amazing, but I'm not going to shy away for a lot of teeth because I've had lots of painful and embarrassing experiences in the past 
which made me realize I need to skill up. And the number one thing I found is that when I started to section teeth, that's when extractions became much more predictable for me. That's when I managed to really gain a lot of confidence in extractions, the ability to section. So Chris, tell us about what percentage of teeth, you're obviously based on a specialist referral practice, what percentage of teeth do you section? And obviously you'd probably be much higher because of the kind of teeth that are getting referred to you. But in terms of your plan A, is your plan A um, usually let's have a go without um, sectioning or, uh, or do you, is your plan A quite often, I'm going to se section from the start? And when would you consider that? I, th I think for a molar tooth now, uh, upper or lower molar, 80% as a minimum is what I'm sectioning. And I could I could get them out without sectioning them, but the collateral damage of doing it that way kind of it, it, it's worse than any benefit of being quick doing it. Um, when when I look at a socket that I kind of elevate and put my forceps on, and compare that to a tooth that I've sectioned and just use my luxators to tease out of the socket, the the difference postoperatively is massive. And I only really started thinking like that when I started placing implants. And then as soon as you start doing that, you just think, why am I not doing this all the time? Because in, in our head, you know, I said before, I think sometimes we think if we put the drill up, we're putting the patient through something bad. Whereas actually, if this is a patient who can cope with a filling, they can cope with two minutes of me just sectioning their tooth. And then the force that I'm putting onto the tooth to remove it is so diminished compared to trying to take it out into one piece. So I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm giving that patient a lot less to deal with with respect to hands in mouths, force when I'm pushing, um, head, head moving around when I'm pushing. Uh, Post-operatively, touch wood, it won't hurt, hurt as much because I'm causing less tissue damage. So I, I think my tolerance for just saying I'm going to do this section is it, almost as low as anybody I know. But but actually, I'm, I'm on board with that because it works for me. And the upper molars that are close to the sinus, I know that if I section that, that's my most controlled way of taking that out without causing a problem. Just having that mindset and changing from thinking plan A is elevation and forceps to plan A is maybe section and then elevate. I think that's a massive difference for you. I I, I think that it's, it's, it's a huge part that we don't get taught uh, in undergrad in our, and I can see why we, do, we, we don't get access to it because in hospital settings, it's like, oh, nurse go get the the, the unit and they, they have to plug this unit in and stuff and so they want they just want everyone to get uh, cracking with luxators and forceps and i don't know how we manage that throughout our undergrad training and and our outreach and whatnot but it is the reality and i think i think and correct me if i'm wrong chris because you would have taught more people and whatnot i think most gdps are not sectioning and elevating because they maybe have, don't have access to the right equipment, but it doesn't have to be difficult. Let's talk about equipment. And then before I tell you about the common mistakes I made when I started to section, right? So first thing about equipment is the fear of using a regular turbine fast handpiece because it's drilled into us that um, because of the air, you risk a surgical emphysema. So even though I was in a practice where I had a fast handpiece, we didn't have um, a surgical motor at that time when I was in, this is like seven, eight years ago. Uh, and I then had that embarrassing moment where I didn't know how to section, I couldn't section, I didn't section, and I had some failures. Fast forward many years, I was in Singapore. And in Singapore, what I did is um, the NSK uh, electric speed increasing handpieces were about half the price they are here. So I bought one an angled one for wisdom teeth uh, and I bought a normal one for restorative with a smaller head for pediatric dentistry and I started sectioning teeth in Singapore again I've, I've talked about this in previous episodes because what happened in Singapore is I felt as though the sh I, I broke away from the shackles of the GDC I had less fear. I wouldn't say I was gung-ho, but I was a bit like, you know what? I'm going to step outside of my comfort zone a little bit. So I started sectioning teeth in Singapore, and I haven't looked back. Like, I, I, like you, about 80% of uh, molars I section. However, am I committing a sin here? It, have I somehow uh, bought into the wrong philosophy here? Is it true that you can get away with uh, electric speed increasing hand pieces and they will not cause surgical emphysema, whereas the other type do? And how common is that? So I, I, I've maybe got two or three different answers there. 
I mean, the, sh the short answer is simple, that I've used the high speed for years to section teeth. Wow. Why Why all surgeons, other also scaring us, man? Like, honestly, my, my consultants just say, no, no, don't do that. You'll get a surgical emphysema and whatnot. And, and, and I, it's just a real shame because restorative dentists, we're using the handpiece day in, day out. Right? We should be like this easy for us. We should it's sectioning should be easy for us. Hitting nail on head is an absolute barrier to, to to entry for the average GDP because you basically are so used to holding a handpiece in a completely different way. I know if I say this, not oral not all oral surgeons will agree with me, which is fine. But if I make my case, um I think there are a few different things that if you just look at any general dental practitioner. The thing they use all day, every day, is their high speed. So if they can use that safely to do deep MO restorations, deep DOs, subgingival crown prep, so they can use an ultrasonic subgingivally, all of those procedures can cause subcutaneous emphysema. But we trust them to use the instruments that they're taught to use in the right way to minimize the risk, which is really what all dentistry is. Um, so I think if you say to that same dentist, oh, well, it's all right for all of those, but you can't use it to section a tooth, that doesn't really sit sit well with me because then you're kind of castrating all dentists, removing the tool that they're probably most comfortable with. Now, you need, you need to teach the skill and say to people, this is how to do it. So, you know, don't raise a flap because that's going to give you an issue. You're opening up a tissue plane where that air can go. Do it flatless. Do it the first thing you do before you even pick your luxator up. So you've not even niggled a little bit of the gingival margin away from the tooth. Just go in and section it. And then once you've sectioned it, back yourself to deal with the bits that you've sectioned. Now, if you look at the kind of subcutaneous emphysema thing, the thing is that there is a risk there. But I think the magnitude of that risk has kind of been overplayed way beyond the numbers that you see in the in the journals. And in their systematic reviews, it's much more common in restorative dentistry, although I'd accept that it's used more often in restorative dentistry. And then the oral surgery ones, uh, some of those, they, they've performed their operation in a way that I wouldn't, in that they've raised the flap and then used the high speed. That, that's a bad idea because that's just asking for trouble because you've got an open tissue plane in some air. But if you're just talking about simply section in a tooth, um, I think saying to a GDP, don't do it that way, is not the most sensible approach. And if I look back to years of being in hospital, I, I can't tell you a single emphysema patient that I saw. I could, you know, go on and on and on about all the infections that I saw and all of the patients in really bad pain, where I just think, you know what, we could have nipped this in the bud if we say to our dentists, right, this is how you do this and go ahead and do it. And and actually in in like as an undergrad, you're right, that I think as an undergrad, we get taught um a very academic process, which doesn't necessarily translate into general practice. And the problem becomes that that academic process um then becomes the law. And so we're worried about litigation. We're worried about our regulators. Um, but it, it's almost like they've lost sight of the bigger picture of what's going on. Um, there are loads of teeth that I take out. That I think, you know what, this person, I, I bet I could get this person taking this tooth out. And actually for the patient, it's loads better for the patient to have it done at that practice than it is to wait a few weeks to come and see me. Um and then the number of those patients who've had multiple courses of antibiotics, they've ended up in A&E, they've had a few nights lost sleep, they've got quality of life issues. I think, yeah, that's really, that's what we should be about. It's like it comes back to what we said at the start, that if oral surgery is anything, it's getting our patients out of pain. And so why stop dentists getting patients out of pain? And granted, because the risk is there, educate them about it. So this is how you do the technique. These are the things that you look for. But but let's not kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. But that's that's my take on it. I, I'm so happy, Chris. Honestly, you won't believe. I'm so pleasantly surprised that you, you you're saying that this okay. And I, and I it makes sense to me because you know I've been doing it in this way uh, with the, and you you raise a great point. Don't raise that flap first because you introduce a plane of tissue and then you uh, significantly reduce your risk of that happening. Uh, is my rationale got some legs that if you actually switch to uh, electric 
Does that reduce your risk or not? If I yeah, just made oh, that up? Oh, yeah. No, no, a hundred percent. Because there are two, there are two things. So se- separate things. So what Zach said makes sense. So if you're in a general dental practice and you don't want to spend loads of money on a micromotor, then get a handpiece that is reinventing. So even if you just have one handpiece to section teeth with, the air comes out of the back of the nozzle. It's not going down towards the tissues. So it's already safer for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then you've got your micromotor, which is electric, so there is no air. Uh, so really, your micromotor is 100% safe because there's no air there. The only thing you've got there is water, but it's really unlikely that your water is under enough pressure to cause emphysema. So you, you drill away. I mean, re- really, with a, with a micromotor, you could raise a flap and drill bone away because there's no air there altogether. Um, so, you, you know, you've got hour high speed, you've got rear venting high speed, and then you've got your micromotor, and you're getting kind of progressively safer. And in an ideal world, if everybody had a micromotor, great, like knock yourself out, we've removed the problem altogether. But it's an expensive way of dealing with a problem. <laughs> Does, you, you say micromotor, but using one of these like NSK red ring hand pieces, that's, that's the same thing, right? Is that okay? Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what we got. Loads of dentists have that, and especially now in the pandemic, to to the whole AGP, non-AGP thing, the way we're getting around it is we're using these um, red ring electric hand pieces below 15,000 RPM. And I've seen loads of practices recently purchase this. So now's the time, guys. You put your fear associate. You probably have the kit now. Start sectioning teeth. Move to Singapore and buy your hand pieces cheap first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't say that. I'm sorry, NSK. Um, but... <laughs> But uh, sponsor me. Um, so, uh, no. <laughs> um, no, ignore him. Sponsor anyway, me. so. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true, actually. Sponsor Chris, because he's, he's onto something really big here. Uh, when I started to section teeth, the first 50 teeth I sectioned, like, I, I, I did a pants job. Right, because you're doing it the first time, and my angulations, uh, it was good that I reflected. It's good that I stopped for, I paused for a second. I thought, okay, next time, how can I do better? But now I'm pretty much spot on every time. But before, I was always veering off a little bit. I could still section it, but I made myself my my life a bit more difficult. So, any top tips that you can give in terms of when you're starting to section teeth? I mean, the main one is looking at your X-ray because as much as I have a shape that I aim for, I'm like thinking up a six. I, I'm more or less a P sign or a Miss AD sign, whichever way your bread's buttered. Um, but it's never completely the same because you'll have a tooth where the palatal root might be a bit more distal or a bit more mesial. So I'm going to change my cut slightly. Um, the distal buccal root is almost always the smallest. So if I'm going to cock up sectioning, it's almost always that I've drilled into the distal buccal root a little bit. Um, but actually, in my head, I don't mind that because it's usually the mesial buccal root, which is the curved one. So that's going to be the tricky one. And then the palatal root, I want the buccal roots out of the way so that I can just put my upper premolar forceps on it and either just rotate it or ever so slightly take it buccally then. But I, I think as, when you start sectioning, you just take that extra 30 seconds looking at your x ray just to see what roots you're dealing with. Um, now, in, in a lower, Lower six, lower seven. I, I prefer using a proper straight surgical handpiece, um, which I know is like against the grain for what we're talking about general dentistry wise. But my logic is simple that is, if I'm sectioning a lower molar, I start at the fication and I work up rather than starting at the top of the crown and working down. Because if you start at the top and go down, you only need to be off half a millimeter and you're in one of the roots. So instead of making it easier, you've made it more difficult. Yeah, been there and done that a few times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. St- still do it. Uh, lower six, lower seven, start at the work my way up. I wouldn't do that with a high speed, though, because the whole thing with a high speed and your air coming out of the front of it is you want to keep the hub of your drill as far away from the tooth as you can. So keep a good two, three millimeters distance so that as you're going through the tooth, the air has somewhere to go that isn't into the tissue. So you're saying the biggest, fattest, longest crown prep bear you can find. And so you work with the tip of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and well, like for an, upper, for an upper six, I'll decoronate it. I'll, I'll decoronate it. I'll, I'll leave two millimeters super gingerly. So I've still got an application point. Then I'll section my roots. And then I know that the tip of my burr is pretty close or into the vacation. 
Um, and if it's not into the vacation, I'll just use my hand instruments to to kind of finish it and uh, finish that sh- section in it. But yeah, I just want my drill away from the tooth and away from the tissues so that my air's going somewhere else then. And it, it, it's, it comes back to what we were saying, it, you know, it's managing the risk. Um, you can do anything in dentistry badly. It's just about learning how to do it properly. And uh, the course that I taught at the weekend, um, three or four of the girls there had been to the same university and they hadn't been taught how to use luxators. Manchester. No, no, not, no, actually. <laughs> Defin- <laughs> definitely not Sheffield, whatever. <laughs> anyway, but Sheffield. <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment, but it was in Manchester. <laughs> um, but I, I kind of look at that and just think, you're missing the point. You're missing the whole point of teaching people how to take teeth out. It's like, no, we've only got a few instruments we can use. Don't remove one of them from our, like, arsenal. It's like, just teach them how to use it properly. Chris, whilst we're on the subject of am I being naughty if, can I ask a couple of am I being naughty <laughs> ifs? Because, because This sounds like the answer is yes. <laughs> no, well, I mean, if I've had to bring it up under that banner, then probably I am, right? <laughs> yeah. You just mentioned Luxatus, right? Um, I quite often use a Luxatus slightly like an elevator, but my approach to it is kind of, if you're using the right technique and you actually are holding the... Uh, butt of the uh, luxator in the sort of palm of your hand, the heel of your hand kind of thing, and you have got a finger up the shank, and you are pushing and wiggling, pushing and wiggling. How naughty am I if I am inter, like interproximally between, let's say, an upper six and seven, and I'm trying to remove this upper seven? There's no eight, so as there's, there's room distally. If I lean on the six and lean on the six slightly, is that on a shape, scale of zero to naughty? Uh, am I? <laughs> well. I don't even need to give you a naughty scale, but you, you're thinking about the wrong end of the instrument. So for your Coupland and your Lutzata, your hand will be the same, but it's the tip that is different. So the whole the whole point of a Lutzata is it's so sharp that you're going to push down, you're going to use it actually to go down, sever the PDL fibers, and then push the socket off the tooth a little Depends bit. what corporate you work for. They're not sharp, mate. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or if you work in a hospital <laughs> yeah. where you're like, yeah, this isn't going to work. And then if you've got a coupling, your coupling is your elevator, but the blade is thicker and it's designed to lean on the tooth. But with with your coupling, the other thing is that I think sometimes as an undergraduate, we just teach them incorrectly because we tell people to go in kind of horizontally. Now, if you, if you take a coupling in horizontally, that's the time that in your scenario, when you rotate that, you are going to lean against the six. You want to go in at like 45 degrees because you're trying to get the tip of your coupling in between the socket bone and the tooth that you're extracting so that when you're rotating, then you're leaning against the socket bone and not the neighboring tooth. So I, I, I use them both. I couldn't use one or other. I've always got them both out. Because I'll start with my Lutzata, but there'll be a scenario where I think, yeah, there's no more, more Lutzata to be done here. Just pick up my coupling and elevate it. How naughty am I if I use a cry- if I use cryers for every upper eight? Oh, honestly, if, if you ask everybody <laughs> listening to this podcast, almost all of them will use the Lutzata wrong. Okay, perfect. Like almost always. Cryers for upper eights, is that okay or not okay? Of course it is okay. Come on. Is that standard behavior? Y- yes and Well, no, y- yes and no. And see, this is, an, this is another undergraduate thing. If you want quick and easy, then for 90% of upper eights, putting your cryers in and turning it is the quick, easy option. But when you look at that eight and it's, you know, low sinus, not a lot of alveolar bone, complicated root, that, that technique, that's the one that's going to pop your tuberosity off. So those are the x-rays where you've got to look at it. Yeah, yeah. You, you've got to look and say, right, uh, cryers, put that down, use my to push the buckle plate off the teeth, use your flat plastic or your Mitchell trimmer and actually push all of the soft tissues off, off the buckle, off the palatal, off the distal. And then when you put your forceps, yeah. And when you, when you put your forceps on and take the tooth out, then if it still fractures and you take some tuberosity off, the best thing you can do is keep all of your soft tissues intact so that if you need to put a couple of stitches across, actually two stitches, and then it's pulled everything together. Yeah, so it's not it's not that it's it, it's not that it's wrong. It's just that it's not always right. But it's like oh, what an educator's answer! You're so pro. <laughs> <laughs> what about physics forceps? Am I gonna am I gonna die if I use physics forceps? Oh, so I, I don't get physics forceps. Great, me neither. 
Every, everyone says that. All, all the oral surgeons, they don't rate the physics forceps from, from speaking to them. Well, I just, I just think, um, what problem are you trying to solve? Because if you're trying to solve keeping the buccal plate intact, section the tooth, whereas if you put the physics forceps on, that little rubber bung, you know, to some extent, that's levering against the buccal plate. And it might not fracture it, but it's going to crush it. So it's still a, you know, it's still a bony injury. Um and I know they work really well for some people, but I, I, I tend to question things that I do all the time. So if I look at that, I kind of think, no, I don't, I don't think that's going to give me what I want. And it doesn't give me any benefit over section in the tooth. I'm going to have to save the, the, the question about the dry socket stuff for a group function one day. So Chris, we're going to have you back for a group function one day. Just talk all about dry socket prevention, management and stuff. Uh, I'm actually really intrigued in this, uh, the way it's heading. Uh, I, I like that Zach has introduced um, Am I Naughty If Oral Surgery Series. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this actually, I, I love this, man. Like, we should do this in every single speciality. No, you can't do it for Perio. Perio is the least naughty. Of Am I naughty if I go gardening? No. Yeah, no, carry on gardening. <laughs> <laughs> am, am I naughty if I've done uh, three six-point charts since qualifying? <laughs> yes, absolutely. You are. <laughs> <laughs> but the next question, the next question, really is how important is? Let's say, let's say a lower molar, and you sectioned it, and you managed to use forceps to wiggle out the distal root, and you had the mesial root left. How valuable? How precious? How important is that um, fication bone? Or can I just whack it away? Can I just take a chunk out of my cryos or, or drill away that um, interfercal bone? Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely come down on the side of that bone is perishable. I, I think I want my lingual plate intact. I want my buccal plate intact. I want my mesial and distal intact. So the first thing I'm going to drill is the interradicular bone. Because if I drill that, the socket will still heal. Nice four-sided defect. As soon as I touch the buccal plate, I've, I've deformed something. Um, so yeah, the interradicular bone, whether you're going to use a cryosin to kind of pinch the bone out as you elevate the root, or whether you're going to put your drill in and trough it or even remove it, yeah, that, that would be my first step. You know, if I section the tooth and then I'm chasing my tail a little bit, even without raising a flap, take the interradicular bone away or at least trough it to get an application point. Yeah, it makes sense. Sometimes that bone can be extremely thick, right? And and that can really um, make it difficult to get your mesial root out. So sometimes I've I've been removing, I've been shaving away at this bone, and I've been thinking, gosh, am I am I messing up any implant issues in the future by removing this um, fication bone? But obviously, I think as you say, in the hierarchy of importance, your buccal and and lingual is is much more important. No, I, th I think if you take your furcal bone, the socket's still going to heal. I think if you take the buccal bone, then you're potentially messing up your implant treatment. Amazing. Zach, any last questions for, for Chris while we have him uh, Am I Naughty If series? I haven't got any more. I've, 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 those are the only sins I've ever, I've ever committed in oral surgery. <laughs> I, go, I mean, I occasionally, I mean, I go crazy and sometimes don't use a figure of eight technique, but, you know, whatever. That's just a, a conversation for another day because we're talking about sectioning and luxating today. So, you know. I'm, I'm not a big figure of eight person, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's a z zero on the naughty. What naughty about scale. what about this one? This is a technique that I just picked up a few years ago, which I occasionally use. You know, when you have got a really chunky upper molar, if you think you need to put forceps on this, right? And I know I've sinned already. However, um, if I do, and I and I fancy a Johnny Mac and Rose double-handed swinging technique, if I open the mesial and the distal contact points of this tooth with a big fat diamond burr, and I give myself a bit of room, is that yay or nay? One hundred percent, like. Any extraction you do, putting a crown prep burr on, drilling out the contact points of the tooth you're taking out is always going to help you because you, you're not you're not affecting your application point with your luxator or your coup lens, but you're giving yourself that wiggle room with the tooth. So, it, and I mean, this is like coming back to looking at your x-rays and picking what your plan is. If I've got a post crown next door or a pinned restoration next door, the tooth I'm taking out, I'm going to take the contact points off because I don't want to touch the neighboring teeth when I'm mobilizing. And you'll see it when you're luxating or you've got your couplings on. You won't always see it when you've got your forceps on. So actually taking the contact points out makes loads of sense. Yeah. yeah. The moral of that question, by the way, is always work in teams and shadow people. If you're in a stage of your career where you are, want to absorb a leech, ask people if you can spend time in their treatment room 
you know, just observing because these are the kind of sneaky little things that you learn over the years because they're not in textbooks. They're just, oh, I picked that up off of, and you become this patchwork quilt, don't you? We always talk about this jazz, the patchwork quilt that you become. Yeah. And you're like, where did I nick that one? I don't know. I can't remember, but I nicked it and it's mine now. So it's now part of my patchwork quilt. You, usually Jason Smithson for me, but I mean, <laughs> I, I can't imagine he uses many crown papers in that fashion, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, thank you so much, Zach, both of you. Thank you so much for giving up both your time today. Uh, I think I'm actually amazed. Like, I was expecting something really good, but what you've uh, delivered, Chris, is something that's going to, uh, using uh, Zach's word, empower dentists all over the world to start practicing safely, being more predictable in the extractions, and getting over the fear of sectioning. However, there will be people who want to learn more, learn safer techniques, uh, more advanced techniques, and I know you do some teaching. Please, please tell us, uh, plug your course for us, tell us where you're teaching it, when you're teaching it, because I think everyone should book on that. If you're not confident in extractions, which I know a lot of you are not, uh, hopefully after this episode you will be a little bit more, where can they learn more from me, mate? Um, so in, in two weeks, so I guess middle of August, uh, the website should go live, which is www.theoralsurgerycourse.co.uk. And then we're doing short hands-on courses with some blended online learning um, at Monnitz Place in London uh, with Joe McInhill over in Enniskillen, with Martin and James at Scottish Dental Courses in Glasgow and with Ian Paul at Ideal in Liverpool. And then for anybody who starts with us, hopefully we'll push a few people into doing a PG dip or a PG cert. I've got to say awaiting accreditation just so I don't get my hands slapped. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think everyone, if you're not, if you're struggling, if you, if, if, you, if you get sweaty when an extraction comes through, if you get nervous, if you're doing lots of endos because you don't want to do extractions, it should be the other way around. <laughs> so, so, so you still usually get on this course. Um, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to have to bring you back to talk about dry sockets. Uh, Zach, thank you for the twists and the turns and introducing us to am i naughty if i'm going to make this a permanent feature of all the podcasts in the future because this is this is brilliant there's probably someone with an american <laughs> accent who's going to do a great jingle am i naughty if <laughs> oh my god this is going to happen john make it happen we're going to do it uh thank you so much jens for giving up your time really appreciate you having you on today so there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. Like, if you gained value from this episode, if this episode has somehow made you think, right, that's it. I'm going to start. I'm going to learn how to section teeth if I don't know already. And I will become more proficient at my extractions. And this is going to start right now. And you feel this helped you. And if you listen on Apple, please do consider giving us a review. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, and if you want to check out more from Chris, do check out his website, which I've linked on the main blog post. He's running an oral surgery course all over the UK. I know it's going to be sold out. I know it's going to be amazing. And I wish I had something like that, uh, it would have really fast-tracked my learning because I didn't learn how to section elevated dental school and it's something I picked up and it's an invaluable skill. And just like Chris, I section 80% of the molars that I extract and it's a hugely valuable skill. And now, finally, I'm hoping he's giving you confidence to use a fast handpiece and not have to worry so much about a surgical emphysema. So I hope you found that useful and I hope you'll find the rest of the episodes coming out in August, which is devoted to back to basics. Hope you found them really useful, really informative and I'll catch you in the next episode.